Hello, and uh, welcome to the interview with Jacques Fresco and Roxanne Meadows. Uh, we have very, very special guests today. Uh, uh, we can best describe Jacques Fresco as a futurist, as a social designer, and as an all-around Renaissance man. Uh, welcome to the interview, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to interview you. Uh, how serious is the state of our planet? Uh, is it true that we are currently experiencing the rate of extinction like never before, if we exclude, exclude of course, the comet hitting the Earth and killing off the dinosaurs? And how long before it is irreversible for us? It could be the next few years. It's very nearby. We're damaging the Earth, the rivers, the atmosphere with pollution, the farms with artificial poisons and things we spray on plants which goes down to the water table, which affects all human beings, regardless of their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say that the main reason for this happening is uh, the hunger for profit in human beings? Not exactly. Misunderstanding, misinformation. We don't have the truth. If you take a child and you bring that child up without love or warmth, he has no warmth to give. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, uh, but, but you say that uh, in today's time that uh, competition is detrimental to our growth as human beings and uh, to our um, uh, to advancement of human race. Would you I say? I would agree that? with that. You would agree with that? Yes. And w what do you advocate instead? That we bring up children so how they relate to nature and how to relate to one another and that a new language has to evolve, a language that's not subject to interpretation, a language that has uniform meaning. Now, if you don't know what that means, mathematics has uniform meaning throughout the world. Uh, chemistry has uniform meaning. If a chemist writes a formula, other chemists don't say, I think he means this, or I think he means that. They know exactly what he means. Mm -hmm. So when a chemist writes a formula, to anybody in the world it comes out the same. We need a language that's not subject to, I think he means this, or I think he means that. Right. Uh and since we're on the subject of raising children, uh, how would you go about it? Uh, what What is the most important thing when raising a child? When raising a child, and I would like you to talk about uh, how to develop a child's brain. In, so the child is a critical thinker. Well, you can't do that conventionally. You can't raise every different mother with a different value system, working on their kids. They're going to make it impossible for kids to talk to one another. You have to have uniform education. When you teach somebody aeronautical engineering, it's not French aeronautical engineering, or Jewish, or Polish. Aeronautical engineering applies in any language and must be taught the same way. Otherwise, you can't build lighting or bridges if you taught bridge engineering differently to different children. The same with love, the same with patriotism. If you teach each, each child that your nation is right, the other nation's wrong, then they believe you. And we can't afford that anymore. We're damaging the world too much. So we have to devise a new system. That means Everybody would like to say things that everybody likes to hear, but that isn't the truth. If a scientist spoke to people with what they like to hear, they like to hear the earth is flat, not round. So scientists don't care what people believe. They speak out, they say, you believe formally that the earth was flat, but we found out by instruments that it's not flat, it's round. So if you have any questions, please question it. Mm. I like that attitude better than 
I speak the truth. Mm -hmm. No one can know the truth. It's very complicated. How does this apply to uh, child raising? What, what strategies would you implore uh, to raise a child? To tell a child what we know about the earth and what we don't know. Tell them the truth. When they ask you a question, say, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe you will find out someday. I don't believe that any of our leaders are wise enough to understand the teachings of religion. Because each person that studies religion interprets it in terms of their own background. Mm -hmm. Now, even Jesus showed doubt. When they were crucifying Jesus, he looked up and said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? That shows doubt. So if all the religious leaders have doubt, you have to know where they have doubt, why they have doubt. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the new society, will there be a place for religion? And if not, how do we get rid of it? Well, you don't need to get rid of it. You have to outgrow the need for it. In other words, instead of hoping for the good life, you make the good life. You increase agricultural yield. You increase studies in nutrition. That's the way you follow the teachings of nature, not according to each individual, which has a different interpretation. Because no religion has bind on the absolute truth. They understand truth as they understand it. I don't doubt their sincerity. I think they're sincerely. But they're sincerely wrong in many instances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Roxanne, we talked about this before, but I would like you to share this with us again on camera. Uh, how did you get to meet Jacques and uh, how, did you, how did you start working together? I first heard some of his lectures. Somebody introduced me to some of his ideas and his inventions and his lectures, and I used to listen to them and found them more fascinating and things that I had never heard anybody say before. Not just talk about what's wrong, but offer an alternative to how we can run society different so it benefits everyone. So I, I went to his lectures. He used to give lectures two or three times a, a, a week at his home. And I started taking drafting lessons from him and, and started working with him mm -hmm. and stayed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how, how different was, uh, were uh, his lessons on drawing, for example, than what you learned in school, in art school? Well, I went to what was supposed to be two very good art schools and graduated college there. But I didn't know the base, basics of art. I didn't know the science behind, behind art, and that's what Jacques taught. And he teaches it very quickly. He moves people as fast as they can go in, in the courses. Uh, so you don't have to, you can do a five-year course in five months. I saw you demonstrate how to teach children how to draw, and I must say it's very fascinating. It's very, very fascinating. You have a... Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this, uh, about the, the method you use to teach children how to draw or how to teach them basically anything? Yes. The, the drawing must correspond <coughs> to the real world, not your opinion. So you must find out how children learn. You've got to watch them, see how they learn. Do they really learn or do they react to the world? I don't know. So I always want to know what the truth is. I thought there was such a thing as truth. But different children learn in different ways. So you have to approach the child in relation to their background. Like the Japanese are here, and they are taught that the Japanese were put here by God to rule the world. And if they're brought up that way, they're going to be detrimental to the rest of the world. So I felt that no nation has the full knowledge of everything. That we must learn how to listen to other people and not just disagree, 
but point out what's wrong with a disagreement. We have to be able to share ideas, not follow a leader. Like, I don't want people to follow me. I want them to listen to what I say. If it makes sense, do it. If it doesn't make sense, question it. And say, where do you get your ideas from? How do I know you're right? Question everything. Not just me, but everybody else. Right. Um, you have stated that the environment plays a crucial role in who we are. But many think that genet genetics is equally important. What is your opinion th on this, and what do you find uh, the most important factor to be? I think genetics gives you the color of the eyes, the shape of the nose, uh, the shape of the body type, maybe even a propensity towards certain disease. But genetics does not give you a value system. Genetics does have nothing to do with greed or envy or jealousy. That's learned. What about character? Character is learned. It is not inborn. Mm -hmm. And if everything is learned, how can you blame anybody? Meaning, if you took a baby, a normal baby, and brought him up in a Nazi culture, if they never saw anything else, they'd be Nazis. I don't think God would get angry at them if they were brought up that way. If you brought up to be a Filipino, I'm proud of it. It's not your fault. It's being raised by a group that believes that. So I don't believe anybody is normal. They're normal to the culture they come from. Well, I have a question for you uh, regarding sports and music. I personally, I, I come from combat sports, and I know you don't have a very high opinion about sports in general. And since cooperation and competi uh, since cooperation and not competition is what will be needed in the resource-based economy, the system you propose, uh, is there a place for sports and music in this new society? Sports in particular. Uh, and what is, on, what is your opinion on sports and combat sports in particular? Well, in sports, I would say that if we have a television image of you playing tennis with yourself, you get better at it. You don't want to beat the other fellow. You want to improve your own performance. But the idea of beating somebody else is not good because they feel bad when you beat them. But if you play against yourself, and the opposite image plays against you, you improve yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to beat somebody else to say, I'm the best. See, that's, that's the sickness of man. He wants to be the best. You can't be the best. You can only be the best that you can be. Oh, well, some people think that uh, competition breeds quality. Do you think this is true? It generates incentive, they say. But it also generates incentive for corruption, for feeling bad, for lying, say, I'm better than you, and for making up stories. Say, well, his grandfather taught him before me. You know, they make up all kinds of lies, just like the Republicans and the Democrats. They lie about each other continuously to try to win. That's not a good practice. The best practice is to say, I really don't know. I don't know where man came from. I don't know where the earth came from. I don't know how it all began. I honestly don't know. That's the beginning of civilization. You advocate leveling the cities because they're not efficient enough and instead of retrofitting, we should rebuild them from the ground up. Yeah. I predict many would have a problem with that. And is it really necessary to do that, and what would we gain? If we don't do that, we'll hurt each other. That's all I'm saying. If you rebuild your cities so they work better, and they're cleaner, and they have no garbage, then you'll have less disease. Mm -hmm. If you redesign the cities so they work, meaning each city has to have transportation built in, so you can dial where you want to go, the art center, the schools, the housing, not everybody driving a car. Because what's the matter with that? If your children fight in the back of the car, 
and you turn around for a short time, you can create an accident. We don't want cars subject to human insufficiency. We want it like automatic trains on the airport. The doors don't open on the train unless the doors of the walls open. Otherwise, you can fall on the tracks. So there should be a wall between the train and the doors that open. Now, they're doing that on airports, and nobody can ever fall on the tracks again. So don't put a sign, stand back, use safety, no good. Built it in. In the old days when people used to operate elevators, they turned a the crank. They never quite got to the floor. Today, when you go to a modern building, you press 30, it stops exactly on the 30th floor. I like that system better than leaving it up to people. Because people sometimes forget, sometimes they give you the wrong medicine. In the future, when you do it by machines, you can design a machine so it double checks or triple checks before you get the medicine. A human can be thinking of something else and give you the wrong medicine, even a, even a doctor. So I didn't want you to think that much of human beings. Human beings, sometimes they get angry. If your wife leaves you, you're not as good a doctor that day. So I don't want to depend on mood or temperament. I want to depend on statistical data. I want to put proximity devices on cars. If you don't know what that is, today you can drive your car up to the building and press a button and open your garage door. You don't need to get out of the car and open the door. You can do it automatically. But I don't believe in one circuit, like six circuits that open the door. If one fails, the next one takes over. It's called redundancy. When there's a power failure, the lights don't go out in the hospital, they go on. So the doctor continued to operate, but if you left it up to man and just had one operating and it failed, you'd have a lot of deaths. Right. So I believe in automation. Automation that surpasses man, not automation before that. So not one system, but many systems. So if one hospital light doesn't go on, I want a whole bunch of units, maybe three. If one fails, the next one takes over. If that fails, the next one takes over. I don't believe in relying on one machine, because if one machine fails, you got a problem. And what do you say to people that think that all this technology that's going to be running the city is not good? Because many fear the technology, uh, so much use of technology that will be present in the resource-based economy. What do you say to those people? Well, I think that they don't understand technology. They don't understand technology as I use the term. Technology as I use the term, never use it unless it's been proven many times to work. Never genetically engineer food unless you were able to run tests for years to make sure there's no bad effects. That's what I mean by technology, not anybody's interpretation. I would say that in order to do that, you have to not say this is good technology, but show statistically how more efficient it is than others, not the opinion of Fresco or anybody else. You have to show data that this system pures water and you show it how it cleans the water. If you don't show people how it works, they just have to take your word for it. That's not good enough. We have to show people why certain things work, why other things don't work. I don't know if you know this, but when engineers design an airplane to support so much weight, they pile sandbags on, bags loaded with sand, and break the wing off to see if it holds up the weight they calculate. It will hold up. I like that system because it doesn't depend on personality. It depends on statistical data. We take one car, we run it into a concrete wall and to see if the dummies survive. If they're, if they're damaged, 
the car isn't good enough. I right. like that system best. Right. Not Fresco's opinions about anything. Scientific data. Now, the big question that normal people ask, normal means mixed up. The question they ask, who makes the decisions in the future? The answer is nobody. They test things, it's strength, it's bending strength, it's torsional strength, it's compression strength, and give you a report of their findings. If you find anything wrong with that, you bring it up, say, what about this, what about that? If they can't answer the question, you put insufficient knowledge to make a decision. What are your plans, Roxanne, what are your plans in, in the resource-based economies uh, to spread the word about the resource-based economy is the feature film that you're preparing. Can you give us an update on this and uh, how much money will it be needed to collect so you can get, uh, so, so you can shoot a feature film and you can also talk about the script that's, that's, that's in the making. We think that this way of thinking is, is so different than what you get in school or what you get in um, on TV and radio and your, you know all the things that influence your values is so different because w the things that you learn throughout your environment are there to support this system that you live under which is free enterprise system almost all over the world so this is advocating something entirely different not based on money and not based on any of the values that support that system. So it, it's a big educational process to get these ideas out there. And we feel the best way to demonstrate this to people is by a motion, major motion picture, because we think it'll reach many people in the shortest amount of time. And when you talk to people, it goes through their head, what you say, and comes out depending on their background, they interpret things. So if you show them life in a resource-based economy and in the future and how people interact with one another and you pose, you show within the film a lot of objections that people today have with the values that they're raised, that this is the best way to do it, to immerse them in the future so that they see that there is another way of organizing society where it's for the betterment of all people and the environment and so they won't become afraid of it. So that's the reason for the major motion picture is a huge educational campaign. How far do you think uh, the movie is from being produced? It's not entirely up to us because we don't have the money to do it and we're working on the script right now. The script is getting farther along. And so as soon as we have that script finished, then we have raised enough funds through donations, through many, many small donations, and it's been overwhelmingly wonderful, the amount of donations we've gotten. So with that, then you generally you have the script, and then you get an estimate for the film, because mm -hmm. there will be a lot of computer animation in the film. Uh, Jacques, you have been called a utopian. Yes. Uh, and your system, the resource-based economy, has been called a uh, utopia by many people. And what do you have to say about this? Is it really a utopia or is it actually achievable? It's not a utopia. It's a better way than we have it today. There are no utopias. Whatever city you can design is the best you know how up to now. But in the future, there'll be new designs. You can't make the best laptop. You can make the best laptop you know of up to now, but 10 years from now, it'll be different and better. So there are no final frontiers. Do you know what that means? No best airplane, no best boat. It'll always keep changing. And so will human beings always change. There are no final frontiers. Uh, I have been raised on Star Trek, the science, science fiction show, and in Star Trek, uh, many of your ideas of, are featured. In the 24th century, in Star Trek, they don't have money anymore. Uh, the incentive for work is non-monetary. It's the betterment of a personality, just like you advocate. Uh, 
Also, they feature replicators that you uh, also talk about in your book. So, have you had any contact with the Star Trek screenwriters, uh, scriptwriters? Yes. Okay. I used to lecture to Star Trek writers and science fiction writers on the future, and they use a lot of the stuff I talk about. People that believe in right and wrong, good and bad, there's no such things, right or wrong, good or bad. If you're raised in the Arab world where a guy has ten wives, that's normal to that culture. Do you know what I mean? But when you come there and you say you should only have one wife, you're trying to bring your values into another country. You understand? I don't say that's wrong, but it's not efficient if you do it directly. They won't understand you. It doesn't mean that people can talk to each other and get them to understand. If your language is different than mine and your interpretations are different than mine, then I can talk to you. When scientists talk to each other, they understand each other. It's not subject to interpretation. When an engineer says a bridge has to be built with beams this size, it's not subject to, I think he means this size. He understands because of a blueprint. He presents a blueprint. Anywhere in the world that he gives that blueprint, they will turn out the same product, not an interpretation of it. Uh, tell me, how often in the past 60 years have you revised your PR strategy? And do you think uh, maybe you can do a better job PR-wise? Well, I've learned how to say, this is the best I know of up to now, but not final. So you don't have to change your mind every two years. Say, and also, if a kid were to say to me, what keeps the moon up there, I might say, I don't know. They say gravity, but I don't know. As long as you say, I don't know, it's open. But if you say, well, if you ask me, I'll tell you, that's an opinion, worthless. It may or may not be true. So you learn how to say, I don't know. That's the most difficult thing for people to say, I don't know. In your book you emphasize the ability to change our minds and challenge everything to be very important in this new society. Uh, but I guess people don't do that very often. Uh, why do you think so? Because people can change their mind. Their mind is changed. See, if I say, man will never fly, and an airplane flies over, I say, I've changed my mind. I didn't change my mind. The airplane flying over changed my mind. If I say, man will never be able to make a machine gun, and he makes a machine gun, I say, I've changed my mind. I don't do any changing. He changed me. Uh, in, your, in your book, you mention... Uh that mentally and physically stimulating games of the future where children will learn cooperation and not competition. Yes. You also mentioned non-adversarial non forms of exercise. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, yes. Can the need for outsmarting others or beating them at something, can, can it really be eradicated? No. Yes, it can be eradicated. If a boy comes over and says, how fast can you run? And I give him a figure. He says, my figure is twice that. I said, then you can run faster than me. I don't need to get out there and run. Well, Lion, how many times did he get the ball on the basket of a hundred throws? He says, 90. Mine is 78. I can't keep up with you. But I don't worry about it. I just know that you spend more time coordinating between your eye and the basket and the ball. But I don't envy you, because it's not that important. But if you spend a lot of time on cancer, and you know what doesn't work, you can tell me what didn't work. Do you understand? So I don't need to do the same thing over again. But instead of giving anybody a Nobel Prize for their work on cancer, if you work on cancer 10 years, and you find out what didn't work, 
That's information to me too. So I don't deserve a prize. Everybody that works on heart disease or cancer deserves a prize. Do you understand? Yes, but can you tell me, uh, is competition, the, the need to compete with each other, to beat each other, is this innate or is it culturally developed? Culturally developed. It's useless because you only bad make bad feelings. It's like a beauty contest. If you were born in a land where people had a pointy head and two horns, that would be beautiful to you. That's why there's no such thing as beauty. Unless people were born with a plastic face and they worked three years shaping their face, I can see giving you a medal. But if you're born with a beautiful face, what the hell's that got to do with anything? But there's no such thing as beauty. Depends on what people are like. If they had six arms, they'd be beautiful to you. So you, so you think that there are no uh, universal... Uh, truths. Not, not truth, but universal uh, forms of beauty. Like, no. you, don't, you don't think that uh, some men will be more attractive to, to most no. women or some women... Unless will be they're brought up that way. If you marry a girl that's very beautiful in your terms and she turns out to be a pain in the butt, that face becomes ugly to you. What about facial symmetry? What about youth characteristics? What about uh, hip-to-waist ratios? Well, sometimes if a person has a genetic structure that's different than yours, you're trying to find out what the difference is. A very fat person that can't compete in athletics may be a better inventor than you. Do you understand? There's nobody that's perfect. No matter what shape your face is in, if you're so beautiful that everybody admires you, that's not good. But if you're less admired, you might be a better thinker. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I was, I was uh, referring to uh, uh, what attracts people to each other. Like, is it all culturally learned? All culturally so learned. So, th there is no uh, universal beauty, like facial symmetry? How can an alligator get excited over another alligator? They're not shaped very nice. It's, it's, it's what you call genetic engineering there. It has nothing to do with the beauty of the alligator. It's a beautiful alligator. A rhino doesn't look beautiful to you, but to another rhino, it means something. Right. Uh, how, do we, how do we achieve resource-based economy? Evolution or revolution? A combination of both. Because if the people become disappointed in the government, they advocate change. But the government can't understand that because the government's brought up differently than the person that can see change. So it's going to take a lot of misery, a lot of suffering to build a new world. You can't just step from this world to the new world. The men that tried to build a flying machine 200 years ago were burned alive as witches. Women in Salem, Massachusetts were burned alive for differing in opinion than the average woman. Are they right? No. But they think they are. They used to put a person on a chair and put them on the water. If they drowned, they were guilty. They always drowned. So they always had the right answers. The average person is extremely stupid meaning poorly informed. That's what stupid means. Not informed as relation to the world works. I don't mean that their brain, but if they're born with a damaged brain, they're taken care of. And we try to cultivate brain tissue and replace that. Instead of you donating organs to a person that needs a new heart, we will cultivate heart tissue and make a heart and give it to you. Mm -hmm but not depending on your money, just because you're a person. Right. Everybody would have free health care. Free access to medical care, mm -hmm. with the best of advisors always. You can present an idea to a person, and a person says, it'll never work. Where won't it work? Pin them down. When Einstein said to me, do you believe in truth? And I said, yes. He said, what do you mean by truth? 
I said, that certain things are a certain way. He says, like what? He wouldn't let me get away with words. I said, well, I said to him, this is smooth. And he put it under a microscope and it looked like that. So I said, is that what it's really like? He said, no. If we enlarge it more, it looked like slivers. I said, is that what it's really like? He said, we can't see things as it really is only as our receptors. You can't see the craters of the moon, but if you put a telescope in front, you can. You can't see germs, but if you use a microscope, you can. So what is a microscope? What is a telescope? They're extensions of human senses. That's why we cannot be conscious. We can only be as conscious as our receptors. Do you know what that means? Yes. You cannot be more conscious than what you can receive. Now, we know there's radio waves moving through the room, but we can't sense them no matter what we do. So, is man conscious? Of course not. He's only conscious of what he can pick up. So, stop looking for truth. You will never see things as they are. You will see things as your senses interpret them. How can people be educated on what is really going on? They might be unsatisfied, but most are having trouble in identifying the causes of their poor living conditions. How can they know what is going on when the bankers are, are controlling most of the media? We do have internet though. Internet uh, is free, relatively free. But uh, most of the media, the mainstream media, the networks are, are controlled by the big corporations. So, how can we educate people on what is really going on? By showing them motion pictures of that things appear differently to an ant. When you make a perfect, perfect smooth surface to an ant, it doesn't look smooth. So the ant says, I'm right, and you say, no, I'm right. You're both right from where you pick it up. Mm-hmm. There's no truth. Mm-hmm. There's no right, no wrong. There are better ways of doing things, yes. Many of us, I know I do, I sometimes get depressed when I uh, think about the world of uh, affairs in the world, mm-hmm. how we are destroying the planet, how we are destroying each other for no good reason, and uh, how do you stay sane in, in, in face of those adversities? Do you have any techniques that, you know... Yes. Stop expecting things. Do what you can and man will do what he can, and if he doesn't do what you do, you just say, I haven't been able to reach him. That's the truth. That man will do stupid things as long as he doesn't know the answer. Like if a man catches his wife in bed with another guy, he may shoot them both, because he doesn't know what else to do. It's not his fault. He hasn't learned better techniques. Does it ever get to you, the whole situation in the world? H.G. Wells, yes. H.G. Wells expected the world to be further along than it is today. So he was very bitter when he died. He felt the world should have been far ahead. But what's wrong is his views, not the world. The world does what it has to do, but H.G. Wells thought they needed to do something else. But what do you think and what the world does is different? So you give the world the best that you have, and whatever it does, it does. But if you're disappointed, you figure the world should have listened to you. They can't listen to you. In your book, uh, The Best Money Can't Buy, you said that a circular city would be a transitional phase and could evolve from a semi-cooperative, cooperative, money-oriented society to a resource-based economy. What exactly is semi-cooperative, money-oriented society, and how would it evolve? Well, if you wanted all the nations to join together, there's only one or few things that can do that. If a media were coming toward the Earth, as big as the moon moving, and be ten years away, all the nations would stop building armaments and share ideas with one another. What can we do about it? We can send a rocket off, try to deflect it. 
So that would bring all the nation, not logic or reason. Do you understand? Right. Any common threat to mankind would bring them together without you talking to anybody. You won't need to convince them of anything. Uh, you said that schools of the future would not feature grading. How would that work? Well, in the schools of the future, you always show motion pictures of what the person is talking about, so the students understand what that person meant. But if you don't show movies, it's subject to interpretation. Mm -hmm. And how do we, uh, today, in today's world, we grade children in schools? Yes, we do. We grade, and they, they pass through first grade, second grade, third grade, they, they are given A's, B's, C's. And it also makes jealousy and envy. But how do we, how, how do we uh, go about it differently in the resource-based economy? In the future, they show them movies, and you repeat what you see in the movie, and it works, and you use it, only if it works. Do you think every child will be able to uh, progress at the same level? Only if they don't have brain damage. If they have brain damage, they're going to need chips that enable them to move the arm that's paralyzed, mm -hmm. not an artificial arm with claws on it. By you saying this to me, I'm, uh, I'm guessing that today's system of education is wrong. That Terrible. And that uh, the possibilities of children's minds are not being harnessed. Enough. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. They're brought up the wrong way, mm -hmm. the old way. He's good, he's bad. He's creative, he's not creative. All that's not true. Everybody can be creative if you know how to do it. So this labeling of children is detrimental to, the, to their self-image? Labeling is talking about your own limitations. There's no labeling. When you ask me, you think man someday will fly without wings? I say, I don't know enough about it. That's the truth. If I say never, it means I can't conceive of how that can be done. Whenever you say man will never fly, you're talking about yourself. Just say, I don't know how to build a flying machine. If a doctor says, you'll never be able to put a leg on a man, never. He's talking about his self, his own limitations. Just say, I can't conceive of how to put a leg on a man. That's the truth. Uh, you worked as a counselor before. Uh, Lots of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell me your opinion on... Uh, Mainstream psychology. Terrible, because they try to adjust you to this system. If they do that, they have to be wrong. So you don't share uh, the, uh, the Freudian view of psychology? Not at all. I am a great believer in environment. If you study a Seminole Indian, you can't tell where he comes from. But if you look at the environment with the TP and the dancing around the fire, la 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 la, with the hat and feathers, that gives you an idea of what makes an Indian. Now, gypsies believe they have the right to steal. And I asked them, why do you have that right? And they said, because they stole the pegs that they were going to crucify Jesus with. The gypsies stole the pegs, so God gave them the right to steal. In Mexico, they build every room at a different height. So I asked them why. It's because the devil doesn't like to walk up and down. He likes to walk on a straight line. So they build everything up and down. Are they sincere? Yes. Are they right? No. And uh, when dealing with people, when counseling people, uh, how, how did you help them? What, what were your methods? I opened the Bible. And it says, it says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say you can kill Wednesdays and Thursdays. It says, thou shalt not kill. And it also says, love your enemy. If a man strikes you, turn the other cheek. It says, don't judge other people, lest you'll be judged. Everybody does jury duty. They're judging other people in violation of the teachings of Christ. So I show them how they're not able to follow even the Bible they claim to believe in. 
Like I went to church many times and I saw women talking to other women say she was married twice. They're not supposed to say that in church. They're not supposed to judge anybody because they don't know what, you know, it says in the Bible, no matter what happens to a person, there but for the grace of, grace of God go I. It could have happened to you too. So you, you refrain from judgment. You say, I don't know. Uh, that criticizes uh, them as believers. As bad believers. They but don't know how to believe. But what about the, the religion itself? Religion itself is made up of different stories, like Moses raised the staff and he parted the Red Sea and the Jews walked across. God could have put the Jews on the other side without all the show. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't believe God has to struggle. It says in the Bible, God knows everything. That's what it says. So he said, it also says, he gave his only begotten son that others might have eternal life and not perish. If he didn't know that the public would execute him, he doesn't know everything. So man can't even interpret God. There are a lot of men I meet that say, I talk to God. I say, you did? What do you talk about? Well, I talk about my family. Did you ever ask God what makes heart disease, cancer, and what you can do about it? No. So they don't even know what the hell to talk about. They're so ignorant, uh, even of their own beliefs. So I gather that, uh, that many people that visited you for counseling uh, were religious people, and you, uh, you managed to uh, make them agnostics or atheists. Yes, mm -hmm. but not by force, not by hurting them. How do, how do you go about uh, converting someone? Do you believe in patriotism? Yes. God says, you shall love one another as brothers and sisters. So how can you be a patriot? Right. I point to the Bible always. To the inconsistency. Now the Bible the says, if you follow the teachings of Christ, or Mohammed, or whatever they brought up, you go to heaven, and you live eternally. So imagine you being 10,000 years old in heaven. You wouldn't want to talk to anybody anymore because you've heard it all. And if you live to be 50,000 years old in heaven, you're not going to say, the children are cute. That's old shit. Do you know what I mean? So it doesn't make sense. What they talk about heaven seems more like man's concept of heaven. And when God makes the world, he says, I don't like what I made. I'm going to flood it all out. This sounds like a confused God. He doesn't sound like an intelligent, all-loving. When he made Adam and Eve and he made the snake tempt them to eat of the fruit of knowledge, he kicked them out of heaven. This guy is supposed to be all-loving, all-knowing. So he would know the snake would convince them and he wouldn't kick them out. The God that man makes is as dumb as man. So he can't even conceive of God. He can't even talk to Einstein. How the hell does he talk to God? He doesn't even know what questions to ask. Man is a very simple organism who feels jealousy, envy, law. If a man is intelligent, if Roxanne fell in love with a younger person than me or an older person, it doesn't mean she's bad. It means I'm not meeting her needs. So I must help her pack if I love her. Not saying, will you break it up our home? You're a terrible person. That's jealousy, self-centeredness, not love. Love is understanding the other person. Can you understand? Nobody loves another person. They love certain things about them, but not everything. Just like you don't love everything about yourself, you like certain things about yourself. Does that make sense? Yes. So love is not possible. You may, you may like yourself when you're seven years old. At nine, you say, what a stupid kid I was. At ten, you say, oh my God. And at 40, you become different. When you fall in love at 16, it's not like falling in love at 31. 
you're changing always. So nobody can finally say, this is right. This is right for me now. But that's all. Once you understand those things, you cannot worship conventional concepts of God because they're so childish. God loves me. God bless America. Who the hell was the president to tell God who to bless? You know, he says, I hope we're doing right. That's all he can say. I don't know. Uh, and final question, Roxanne. Uh, what is next for the Venus Project? What kind of projects do you have in the future? Will there be any more lectures? Uh, is this lecture in Banja Luka and Russia your final lecture? So, what is next for you? No, we have lectures scheduled after that as well, after Russia. The end of September, we have another lecture um, in, in Arizona. So we, we don't stop. Jacques is 96, and he's still going. You know, the body's slower, but he's, he's still lecturing and talking about these ideas. So um, it, it's not always up to us, because we don't have the resources or the power to do what we want to do. We just do whatever we can do. If we get stopped on one project, we go on to another project. But we're always working on it. We work on it around the clock. We put all our funds to it. So we believe there's really nothing else worth working toward. Mm -hmm. I don't do it because God is watching me. I help an old lady across the street because I feel for the old lady, not because he wants me to do it. Right. You don't do anything for reward. You do it because you believe in it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I'm afraid of people that do it to say, God, how am I doing? All right? I help two old ladies say, that's commercial. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this interview. It was a pleasure. Your lecture as well was a pleasure. And uh, I hope you continue on your way and uh, do many more lectures in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.